Uh, today we begin looking more carefully at one of the most extraordinary thinkers and writers who has ever lived. Uh, living four centuries before Christ, 427 to 348 BC, Plato designed and assembled a systematic treatment of some of the world's great ideas and most probing questions. When Alfred North Whitehead suggested in the 20th century that all of Western philosophy, even to his time, could be regarded uh, as a series of footnotes to Plato, I think he meant a couple of things. Plato's range of thought includes math, politics, ethics, music, human relations, uh, many of the topics that now in the 21st century have become separate compartmentalized disciplines handled apart from all the others in our academic settings. Which leads us to the fact, uh, the, the other point there, that, that Plato was possessed by the belief that all of our truths ought to fit together somehow without internal contradictions in the system. Now this is a basic tenet of most philosophy in the Western world, in Europe and the Americas, that, that a contradiction is not some sort of mystical insight to be held in awe and pondered upon. A contradiction is a problem that needs to be resolved. And if Western philosophy stands for anything, it is that principle of contradiction. All right, so to summarize there, Plato's thought is, is incredible both to the degree of, of its comprehensiveness and also for the system that he develops to show the internal relationships there. And to top it all off, Plato was just incredibly artful in his writing. Virtually all of his philosophy is presented in dialogue form. We can sense the way that the, the pertinent ideas there have seized the minds of Socrates and some of his companions. They argue with all their heart about these ideas. And, each establishes and defends a particular perspective in each of the arguments that arises, and some of them tell stories, memorable stories, parables. They, they construct allegories. And when we read Plato's dialogues, sometimes we ponder quietly, sometimes we laugh, sometimes we cry, but somehow they all stick in our minds and work to help us change and grow. I mentioned in the introductory lecture that reading Plato was one of the things that drew me into philosophy. Now I know that's true of a great many philosophers. They've said so explicitly. <clears throat> in that opening lecture, I focused on Plato's fixation on there being two kinds of important truth. Truths based on this changing world in which we live, truths which therefore change constantly as the world itself changes, and truths that are not based on visible reality, truths which seem never to change. Now in that latter category, mathematics, especially geometry as it would develop, intrigued Plato. Let I me mean, try this little visualized thought experiment. Construct three triangles that are very different from one another. <laughs> Art is not my forte. Construct three triangles very different from one another, and then snip off the corners of one of them and arrange them side by side so that the points are adjacent to each other. And then do it with the next one. And then do it to the one after. In every case, no matter which triangle you use, the three pieces will fit together in precisely a straight line the three angles will add up to exactly 180 degrees. Always, no exceptions. Now I suggested that you do that with, say, visible pieces of the triangle. 
But very quickly, we can, we, we can move to a level of thinking about that, which does not require markers or paper and scissors or anything like that. We've discovered a significant truth that we can, we can visualize even with our eyes closed, that no matter which way you draw the lines on here, you can draw them like that and like that, or you can draw them like this and like this, that if you put these three around here, they define a triangle, and these three angles define a different triangle, and you can picture that. Triangles you picture are not carelessly drawn like mine, so they don't really depend on carelessly drawn figures. They are ideal, abstract, perfected kinds of objects. So when we close our eyes and begin to think about that, uh, we realize that we have a kind of truth that does not depend, for example, on establishing priorities. It's not the case that the angles will probably equal more or less, a, you, know, you know, 180 degrees. It's, it's not that. It's a very precise truth. And you might decide to use some kind of measure other than the degrees that have become common to us, 360 in a full circle. But the relationship between them will always be the same, and it defines the abstract perfect triangle in our mind. Now, we could change the basic assumptions and establish a different kind of geometry. Some later mathematicians would do that. But in what we have called typically plane geometry, where a triangle only exists in two dimensions, we have an unchanging truth. The angles of any triangle will always add up to exactly 180 degrees. Now, dig one step deeper. Why is that true? Where does a truth like that come from? And why is it true no matter what country you live in, no matter what language you speak, no matter what century you happen to have been born in? How can that be? What's the status of such a thing? So in Plato's thinking, this idea, as it turns out, seems to have a reality that's independent of us, independent of our thought. I mean, our drawings are only approximations of something far more perfect and more precise. And so Plato says this, ideas like this are real. There is a reality, a level of reality, in which ideas like this dwell. Not just true, as I talked about in the introductory lecture. Not just true, they are true, but they're also real. They have a reality of their own, an independent existence apart from the visible realm and apart from us. And thus begins Plato's account of a dualistic kind of knowledge. Two kinds of knowledge, which will lead him into saying there are two kinds of reality. Two kinds of truth, that based on the visible world, and that based, not based on the visible world, and two kinds of reality, visible and invisible, things and ideas. Now, not only does he wish to claim that things are real and ideas are real, he wants to say that certain kinds of ideas are more real than any thing, more perfect, and certainly more important. Now, all of that might have stayed over in the math department, except for Socrates. In the first place, Socrates had changed the fashion of philosophizing by focusing on issues in daily life rather than the, the nature of the physical world. Justice, beauty, love. Socrates had put those in the center of fashionable conversation rather than accounts of the irreducible particles that make up the physical matter around us. And then the thing that made it all important to Plato. Once Socrates had done this, had made it fashionable to shift from talking about the external world to talking about our lives and our relationships, they kill him. They 
killed him. They executed this wonderful, noble man, Socrates, for daring to shift the focus of fashionable conversation away from money and power to something much more profound. The offspring of rich and powerful men were some, suddenly dreaming of a different kind of life. Socrates had subverted the young people of Athens. And so the esteemed and respected Senate of Athens used its established procedures of justice to bring charges against Socrates to propose their, propose their own revision about the truth of what Socrates has actually been up to. They found Socrates to be a threat to their established leadership and they killed him legally, following the established legal procedures worked out by the establishment leaders over time. And Plato's heart was broken. You can bet it was. And Plato invested the rest of his life in trying to explain and write about the kind of truth that Socrates had addressed that would contrast with the ways of thinking prominent in the establishment. That struggle has never ended. It continues to this day. If you think, for example, that all you need from education and training are job skills, you're thinking like that Athenian establishment. Power and wealth trump all other considerations in their view. And you'll hear that from every quarter of our society, even from some university faculty. But if you think there are more noble ideas to live by, if you think it's more important to question establishment thinking and try to redirect it toward timeless goals, goals that establishment thinkers will label as impractical or unrealistic, if you think having compassion on your neighbors is important enough that you actually care to stake your life on correcting sloppy thinking and, and undermining the nefarious, enslaving, oppressive activity of those in power, then you will find in Plato and in his exemplar, Socrates, two helpful guides to the big problems of the world. Now, I'm not hopeful, actually. <laughs> Too many people in this time, and perhaps in many periods of time, are content to settle for holding opinions and holding their opinions firmly, using rhetorical devices to make themselves sound confident and sincere and knowledgeable to those around them, and indeed, even ready to suggest that we can never get beyond our separate opinions, that there is no unchanging truth, that we must simply settle every dispute that arises by what they like to call a democratic procedure, a vote, in which every opinion has a chance to rule the day. I am not hopeful that Socrates and Plato will change enough of us to make a big difference. But in every generation, there are a few. A few who hear and respond and seek something higher and better in life. Now, all of this has a couple of important implications for reading Plato. Plato mistrusted democracy. Democracy sinks to practices of manipulating the emotions of those who are about to vote. Democracy can involve equal votes for all those who are enfranchised, regardless of their qualifications, regardless of their knowledge or lack of it, regardless of their level of understanding or experience. And Plato will try to, be, uh, try to figure out how political life might be placed in the hands of those who are the most qualified. That's what we do in most areas of life. Uh, when we hire professors here at the college, we sift through hundreds of applications and, and resumes and examine many facets of, of, the, of the qualifications and the other facets of the people who apply. Um, if, you, if you go to the hospital for surgery, 
there are only a few people there who have been through the rigorous preparation and examination to qualify as surgeons and be certified to do surgery there in the hospital. Uh, in, in many areas of life, we put the important decision and work in the hands of those with exemplary preparation and accomplishment. But in politics, in democratic politics, it's usually wealth and pre-existing power that carry the day. They know how to make the game work for them. And in every age, when you suggest that there are more important things to base a life on than competing for that wealth and power, members of the ruling class will look at you incredulously. What could that mean? How could you say such a thing? They really don't get it. They would kill Socrates all over again. The other even more influential feature that this gives rise to in Plato is the way that his dualistic search for knowledge led him to a dualistic account of reality. From his dualistic epistemology, Plato set to work out a dualistic metaphysics. Epistemology, from the Greek word episteme for knowledge, is the study of knowledge. Metaphysics refers to that which is most real, at, a, at the highest possible level. We'll talk about the origin of those words along the way. But this is about how we know. And this is about the nature of that which we know. And in both of these categories, Plato is going to develop a dualistic explanation. He does that with a divided line. And we're going to come back to the divided line next time and, and deal with some of the details and the implication and a an, an, an allegory he tells to help us understand it all. But the divided line is, is a diagram that looks like this. He says, suppose you have a line and you divide it in unequal portions. And I warn you, the one in the textbook must have fallen prey to the table uh, function on the computer program or something that got out of proportion. <laughs> so let me tell you what it's supposed to be. He says, suppose you have a line and you divide it but one part is larger than the other, and, and it's larger because it deals with more important things. You know, so we'll put the line here a little below the midpoint. And then as it turns out, he's going to put other divisions in each of these with, with the same proportional difference. And up here at the top are going to be the really important ideas. the kinds of ideas whose reality is such that they never change. Always the same. The kind of truth that is, one might say, eternal. And below that is something pretty close to it. And I think, and this is debatable, but I think a good way to state this is to say that it's logic and math. It requires us to work out certain kinds of things, but they work out according to fixed patterns in very helpful ways. And then below the, the midpoint of the line, we run into the visible objects. That's you and me and the chairs and the, the lectern and all these other things that we can look around and see as well as things you can see looking in telescopes and microscopes and so on. Uh, uh, since vision is our most important sense, that's the one that comes back most of the time, even though sometimes he just calls this the realm of living beings. It's us and the things around us. And below visible objects are images. And typically they are images that reflect something about the visible objects. A picture, a carving, a reflection of something up here. Now Plato says if we think in this way, we have a range here in the same system from things that never change down to things that change quite often. 
And there's a dependence relationship on this thing, on this, on this diagram. Everything that's low on the chart depends in some way on what's above it. You know, a reflection of uh, your reflection in the, in the mirror through the years will change because you will change. And so um, the dependence is there, the different amount of change. And so he calls this level up here at the top the intelligible realm, the place where we get knowledge and understanding. But on the bottom, and uh, <laughs> let, me, let me reverse these words because I, I wrote them that way and then put the things on the other sides. We'll call this metaphysics, this epistemology, like the one in your book, I think. Uh, so we'll put knowledge and understanding on this side. And down here, we'll put opinion and imagination and things like that. So on this side, when we seek to take account of, of these particular kinds of reality, he says, we could think of this as the realm of being and this answers the question about what is real. Whereas down here we have a realm of things he calls the realm of becoming, that which is always changing. So that which never changes and that which changes a lot. On one side an attempt to explain different kinds of knowledge which he discovered, and on the other attempt to explain how that account could be true because there are different kinds of reality. So that's the dualistic element. Two kinds of reality, which explains why we have two kinds of knowledge. Now he will put up at the top, he says, the good as the most important of the ideas. And that no doubt reflects the influence of Socrates. It's not just understanding geometry, it's understanding human life and human relationships. Well, even if you haven't been captivated by Socrates' vision of the responsible life, you have been shaped, even if you're unaware of it, by this divided line of Plato, and that's where we'll focus the discussion in our next class. But for now, with the time we have left, we'll settle down and talk about the details of today's reading. Thank you.